Do you want to diversify your investments? Then visit squaredfinancial.com and explore great opportunities. Good day, VC. This is Blessing Suke from South Africa, Pretoria. Uh, I started listening to your podcast last year in 2021 and you played a very huge role upon my life. I remember there was one podcast, I can't remember if it was Pering or what, but there's this quote I took there and it kept me going. I passed my metric so well because of that quote. It says, self-respect is aligned to self-discipline. If you really respect yourself, you will be committed to the things you said you would do long beyond your feeling. Men, Vusi, keep pushing. I keep pushing because of this. I'm not doing my first year of computer science. I'm pushing and I definitely am sure that I will make it in life. Thank you, man. Hello, family. And welcome to another episode of the VT Podcast. And here we talk about ideas that matter. That statement was a blessing from my brother, Blessing all the way from the southernmost tip of the African continent in South Africa, in a beautiful part of the land of South Africa called Pretoria. And Blessing, as it appears last year, was doing his final year. For those of you who are in the British system, it would have been his A-levels, his final year, what we call matric. And this year, he's now at what the Americans would call college, what we call university, and he submits that he's doing his computer sciences studies. Thank you so much, Blessing, for those kind words. Those words are a blessing to me. I love the work we're doing. I love the community we've built. I love the tribe that we are and the constant machinations of what it is that we're involved in, this program of building ourselves, building each other, and building the future. A quick reminder that if you haven't signed up for the VT Club 100, I suggest you do so and really, really quickly. It's filling up. The slots are almost full on vtclub100.com. Go over there and sign up. It is a paid-for mentorship program, but you get direct one-on-one mentorship with me, as well as a couple of other group sessions and some amazing incentives and all sorts of stuff going on. So do yourself a favor. Go and check out the VT Club 100. Right. Blessing. Now that you've said that, it lines perfectly with what it is that I wanted to talk about this week. In our podcast this week, we talk about the march of folly the march of folly the march of folly was a book made famous in 1989 but was written in 1984 by Kompf in new york city the actual full title of the book written by barbara w touchman is the march of folly from troy to vietnam the book is about one of the most compelling paradoxes of history, the pursuit of government of policies contrary to their own interests. I'll say that again. Pursuing a series of of policies that are contrary to your own interests. So the first question to ask ourselves is why would a group of people charged with governing a society, a country, a system, governing, uh, charged with governing an institution, put together a series of laws that would act in the antithesis of what is their interests? The answer for this is quite simple. It's what we call situational blindness or battle space blindness. See, in war, generals talk about something called battle space awareness, really having a line of sight of the full battle space. It's ensuring that you have no blind spots from which your enemy can attack you and take you out because those blind spots can be used by your enemy, but also those blind spots can lead to misinformation, misdirection, and then therefore necessarily poor decision making. So, you want to eliminate fully the blind spots. You want to illuminate the spaces where you have a lack of information, a lack of energy, perhaps poor collection of information mechanisms to ensure that all the data at your fingertips that you're going to use to make decisions is data that is current, that is rich, that is contextualized, but most importantly, 
data that aids decisions that work in your interests rather than against your interests. You know, there's several cases in history where this has been the case. Think, for instance, about the very sole story of the Trojan horse. So, for those of us who came to learn about the story of Troy first, when the archetype, really the quintessential man, Brad Pitt, played Achilles. If you remember the movie, Brad Pitt plays Achilles, and in one of the opening scenes, he fights Nate Jones. Now, I'm showing my age here, so anybody here who judges me, as they say in South Africa, for sec. But Nate Jones was this massive wrestler. He was on WWE when I was in high school. I want to say here, like, 2000, 2001. He's like six foot nine, and he's built like a tank. Go right now on your Google and Google Nate Jones. Jones. I'm going back to the days when WWE was the WWE. I'm old enough to remember when it was still called the WWF. I'm old enough to remember Yokozuna. And if you don't know Yokozuna, I strongly suggest you consult Dr. Google, right? I'm old enough to remember when Hulk was still Hulk and calling everybody brother. I'm old enough to remember that WWE. I'm old enough to remember Razor Ramon, who's since passed away. I'm old enough to remember when Kevin Nash was Diesel. I'm old enough to remember when Shawn Michael was the heartbreak kid. You see where I'm going with this? I've been around this game. The greatest wrestler without question of all time and all generation. Goldberg, 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 Goldberg. Can you hear that military music, that chant? Do, 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 Come on! You know what I'm talking about, and Goldberg comes out and right out of his door after they knock it, and he walks through that like rush of heat, and as he comes out, he's kicking and punching and he blows the smoke into the eye. He had the most intense face ever, with but without question, the most beautiful set of trapezoid muscles ever on a male. You've got to go and watch those Goldberg videos. Massive shoulders, huge traps. And of course he would take his enemy out with the spear. That's the WWE that I remember. Now, after that brief segue, let's get back to the story of the March of Folly. So, in the movie Troy, and I forget the year that it was made, but in the movie Troy, Brad Pitt plays Achilles. Great role, and what a phenomenal betrayal of Achilles. It is the reason why the tendon to the back of your heel is called your Achilles heel. It's because Achilles was, it was completely difficult to defeat. In fact, he was, as they say, invincible. And he was shot with an arrow that went to the back of his foot on the tendon, then became known as the Achilles heel. Tendant. It was the only weakness he had in his body. The Achilles tendant to Achilles was hair to Samson, right? It was the weakness in his body. In that movie, you remember vividly the scene where the Trojans need to pierce through the gates of Greece and impenetrable gates that stand and Greece. Of course, the Trojans had come to attack the city and had come to attack Greece because Helen, who later became known as Helen of Troy, had left her husband and left and eloped with one of the princes of the city of Greece, Hector's younger brother. Hector, of course, dies in the movie, murdered by Achilles. Achilles murders Hector because Hector thought he'd killed Achilles when in fact he killed Achilles' nephew. I think, uh, comrades, you can tell that uh, I have uh, watched uh, this movie perhaps more than is my healthy dose, uh, really, uh, of watching movies. So let, let me say this the way politicians say it in South Africa. 
Well, uh, I have watched this movie a lot, uh, really too much, actually, actually. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the story. So the Trojans figure out that they're going to give a gift to the people of the city of Greece. And to do this, they're going to give them a gift of a massive horse. And they deliver the gift and pretend to have left the city. The people of Greece accept the city and they pull the horse into their city accepting the gift. And of course, later on that night while they're sleeping, this horse made of pallets of wood starts to break down and unbundle and coming out of the horse are the most trained legions of the Trojan army. It became known today as the Trojan horse. The Trojan horse is when you make a decision presented with information that acts counter to your own interest retrospectively when you visit that decision. It is when you have an impenetrable defense to whatever it is you've done, whatever it is you've built, whatever it is you're about, wherever it is you are, and yet there is that one thing, that seemingly small, innocent thing that you accept not understanding that it can be a Trojan horse. Think, for instance, here about the formation of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Do you know what led to the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century? Well, what led to the Protestant Reformation was the failure of the Renaissance popes to address the factors that would lead to that Reformation. The Renaissance popes were the popes who later on would adopt a series of systems that would become known as the Renaissance Papacy, or as we call it today, the Papal Enclave, or rather the Papal Conclave. And the Papal Conclave actually came to be in about 1417. It is the way that the Pope gets elected today. The system of cardinals who meet and they have a discussion and a conversation. But the meeting that took place around then led to a Western schism, which would then become the Reformation leading to the Reformation I mentioned earlier. Pope Martin V, in fact, was the Pope being elected at that time. And it led to the Protestant Reformation. Think even if you would about England's policy and in particular, England's policy relating to the American colonies under King George III. Why did England take on the policies that she took on? Why did they react the way that they reacted? Why did they act the way that they, re they acted? Why did England insist on being a part of what would later become known as the American Liberation War, Civil War really? But why did England play the role that it played in the time and archetype of history? England itself had a march of folly. You see this even in more recent times. In the Vietnam War, for instance, and the defeat that the Americans suffered with the last chopper leaving Saigon. Reminiscent, isn't it, when you watched those footages of the American soldiers leaving Afghanistan, and you saw civilians clinging to the wheels of those American fighter jets. The march of folly is when you have the army, the generals, the tools, the infantry, the artillery, and yet you make all the wrong decisions and you in effect defeat yourself. It's called the march of folly. Whilst the book is a fascinating study and a phenomenal read, there are a few things that we can learn from the book, The March of Folly. Paul Johnson criticized the book years later, talking about the conventional, not to say threadbare lines, which were liberal media developed in the 1970s. His entire thesis really was that the book studied these events only from one side. My argument and my submission here was that Paul Johnson not only was wrong, but also he was conflicted. What we learn from the book, a phenomenal piece of literature by Barbara Tuchman, is simply this. 
that every single enemy has a weakness, even the one you're facing. The second thing we learn is that generally the enemy is weakest at the point at which they think they are the strongest. When it appears as if they can lose no more, when they have conquered more battles than they themselves dare to remember, when they have won more wars than the generations of kings can recall, when they have taken more territory than they have the footprint to control, when they control more territories than they have the governance to manage. Even then, in fact, especially then, as the king rises at his peak, so does he fall. The March of Folly is a cautionary tale to all of us. It says that no matter who you are, no matter how strong you are, stay humble, stay close to the ground. Remember always that the battle belongs to those who are diligent, careful, clinical, and most importantly, humble. The battle belongs to those who understand that no matter how impenetrable your walls are, there exists always a Trojan horse. The battle belongs to those who know that the underdog today is the ruling dog tomorrow. And so for all of us then, the cautionary tale is do not take your march of folly. <laughs> what a podcast, right? What a thought and what a series of ideas to think about. So what are the things I'd like you to do this week? Well, first, I'd like you to think a bit about the parts of your life where you believe you are the strongest right now and ask yourself if you were ever to be defeated in those parts of your life, what would that look like? For those of you who are in your nuptials and you have a family and you believe your family is strong, ask yourself how could somebody penetrate that? What would that look like? And have honest and frank conversations not only with yourself but also with your partner. But how do you protect your union? For those of you that control a business, ask yourself a similar question. I might be ahead of the pile now, but how could I lose? And if I were to lose, what would be the convening set of factors that would have to converge all at the same time for me to lose? For those of you who are professionals in the upward rise and trajectory of your career, whose pace and tempo is accelerating as you sail yonder into the horizon of greatness. Even for you, there exists always the march of folly. Jim Collins calls it exuberance, irrational exuberance. So, do the homework, do the thinking, and no matter what you do, stay humble. That is our podcast for this week. From me, Vossi Tembeguayo, and our partners here at the studios at Sound and Sounds in Joburg. In the words of The Rock. And I end this as I began it talking earlier about wrestling. If you smell what this podcast is cooking. <laughs> I think I should genuinely be a wrestler. Like, I'm doing it. I'm going to enter wrestling. I need a name. Send us some feedback on this podcast and tell me what you think my podcast name is. I need, like, a strong name, like a killer name. Like, you know, the kind of names black people give dogs in townships. I'm talking about names like Danger, Giant, Electric Fence, Police Dog. That's the kind of name. Give me a name what you think I should call myself because I'm definitely going into wrestling. 6'2", 105 kilograms, was all muscle, but I I haven't been to gym for about a month, so there's a bit of flab there, but we don't need to talk about that. I can get back in shape. Send me a name and what you think I should call myself getting into wrestling. That, friends and family, is our podcast for this week. Sayonara. Relax, trade, and take it easy. Visit squaredfinancial.com and unfold a world of opportunities. Hello family. So many of you have asked me for direct mentorship. Now you can get it. Go to vtclub100.com or just hit the link below really.
I'll see you soon.